Hi, welcome to the Mindset Junkie Podcast. I am your host, Seamus Fox. I created this podcast to inspire people like you. People who want to create change in their lives, but possibly feel stuck. I love speaking with guests from all over the world who have created change in their own mindsets so that they can be the best and the highest version of themselves. They have greater impact on this world. So strap yourself in and enjoy the Mindset Junkie journey. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mindset Junkie podcast. Today's guest is Christina Mann Christina is a serial entrepreneur, a speaker, a mother, a philanthropist, and a woman on her own spiritual journey. Christina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Christina, what I like to do for the listeners is kind of take things back to the start. Um, what was it like as a young Christina growing up? Where did you grow up? And what were those early inspirations and influences? Hello, I'm really sorry. It looks like my internet gave me a glitch. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, it should, be, it should be fine now. It was in the wrong network. Okay, no problem. So as I was saying, I'd like to take it uh, back to the start for the listeners and to give people some context in terms of who you are. What was it like as a young Christina growing up? Where did you grow up? What were those <laughs> early influences and inspirations? Oh, yes, <laughs> that's a good question. So I actually was born in Soviet Union. So it's a country that does not exist anymore. And not only it does not exist, but it's also very... Uh, unusual and maybe inexplicable for a lot of people country so um, you know in a way uh, we look at some very remote and closed countries right now so I was born in Soviet Union and I was 14 when uh, it collapsed so my uh, early uh, education <laughs> was unusual for contemporary western society and uh, all my uh, idols and, and role models are I had to, unfortunately, I had to reevaluate my uh, take on life for a lot of reasons, uh, because uh, it, it was a different society, it was idealistic society, and um, it put uh, a grand ideal above, uh, above uh, individual humans, so uh, a lot of the things um, don't make sense anymore. For example, very simple example, in Soviet Union, you couldn't do business and I am an entrepreneur. So this was something I had to learn later in life. I did not grow up with any idea of what a business is about because it was illegal in Soviet Union. And when Soviet Union collapsed, it was uh, very um, dark and, and uh, semi-criminal. So uh, I didn't have, um, I mean, I had role models, but they're not useful right now. Yeah. I had to acquire new ones when I grew up and, and uh, yeah, along the life. But that's in a nutshell. I do not know how, how deep you want me to go in, in well, that. I suppose like what was um, like for me looking at like the early childhood, a lot of the times where you experience certain things or influence in certain ways that affect um, like where we are right now. So mm -hmm. was there early influences or was there certain things that you experienced that created some values that you have right now? Was there fo uh, voids that you experienced or perceived voids that you had that kind of made you into the person that you are right now? You know, it's an interesting thing because I believe that every single step of our life makes us uh, into a person that we are. The question is, do we like the person that we are? Do we do we like what we have? But uh, whatever has happened to us in some way or another has influenced us. And I know I do mention Soviet Union from time to time, mostly to give the context. But I've once I remember getting a comment from one of my readers uh, that um, they felt like uh, it was my trauma, which actually, you know, I thought about that and I don't think it was in my case I was very lucky and happy uh, first of all of course when I grew up Soviet Union wasn't as strict as it was in the very early years so there was some some level of freedom and, and liberty uh, and also I was lucky with the parents I guess <laughs> because I had a fairly happy childhood but uh, some things that did happen of course I was a perfectionist uh, it was a very a strict society with a very uh, specific moral uh, uh, like code mm -hmm. uh, we might disagree with certain things but it was a highly moral society and not just that but it was very open to public in a sense well, within the uh, confines of, uh, of Soviet Union, hmm. if anything happened, it was usually not, not just you and the 
you know, like when my kids uh, have any troubles in school, the teachers talk just to me and whoever they have troubles with. But in, in Soviet days, if anything happened to you, the whole society was judging you. So it, it was even unrelated things. I wasn't grown up in Soviet Union, but I know that if you were grown up and you did something which society frowned upon, for example, well, it's a, maybe a horrible example, but infidelity, which technically speaking has nothing to do with you professionally, but they would actually have meetings uh, you know, discussing your behavior in private settings, but they will have the meeting in the in the office, and it will uh, implicate your your career choices and your and, and your success, um, professional success. So that was an interesting thing, and of course, of course, it left a huge mark on me because I am a perfectionist. I've struggled a lot with that because perfectionism is such a joy killer, such a uh, such a killer of a lot of things, even creativity, even achievement, uh, and that has been a huge struggle for me. And that's something which I carry uh, on from from Soviet days. Another one was definitely. Do you feel that that type of like that type of scenario and that type of society then, um, Christina, is like obviously it's a shaman type of culture where you have to fit in this specific model. Has that always been like something that you're looking nearly for acceptance or to try and fit in that, that type of scenario? Did that play out for you, or was that something you felt? Influence. You know, dissent wasn't an easy thing for sure. In the old days, it was uh, massively punishable, like you would lose death, uh, li life. But also, like being different wasn't an easy thing in Soviet mm -hmm. days. And of course, it was a, a, in a way sterile environment, as in we didn't have a, a lot of racial, like, like people of different races, let's say it, it was very homogeneous. We didn't see handicapped people. We didn't see, uh, uh, they, they, now they'll laugh at it, but they said we didn't have prostitution. We didn't have, uh, you know, gays. And of course that's not true, but that wasn't visible. That was all swept up. Yeah. Sorry? It was portrayed as a perfect society. Well, there was a wish for that, yes. So the perfectionism was very deep. Another interesting aspect, which I think I, I did have to struggle quite long afterwards, was the idea of, uh, of you being insignificant uh, and the big grand idea being much more important. We So when you ask me about role models, unfortunately, our role models were people who would, uh, who would give up uh, like even, even things which are uh, dear and close to them for the grand idea. For example, there was this one young boy who was considered a hero because he gave up his dad because he thought his dad was against the new regime. So that was what was idealized. You will give up even your closest person, your child, your spouse, your, your parent for a grand idea. And the grand idea was something in the hands of the, of the state. So of course uh, that state doesn't exist and that grand idea is now, uh, well, it was communism. <laughs> There's no more of a fiction than anything, but uh, that martyrdom complex that carried on for a long time, that, th that thought that, you know, my happiness is irrelevant, my well-being is irrelevant, it's, uh, it's a noble thing to care about someone else or to, uh, to, to put your life or sacrifice your life to, to a grand idea. And I would say that in uh, most of the world, well, the world that has access to, to internet and podcasts and, and shows like that, uh, it is something which is not an everyday thing. Mm. Uh, you, you don't really need to sacrifice your happiness. And that's such an interesting thing. It took me years to understand that my happiness does matter. My well-being does matter. Uh, and yeah, that, that's something I think I carried from my Soviet childhood. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And, and you're 100% right, because how you um, and your uh, health and your happiness influences you also influences other people and has a much wider effect on society in general, especially in your role in, in terms of what you've done and what you currently do. Um, so you mentioned school, etc. Um, did you leave school or how long did you kind of stay in the Soviet Union or like what was that path, Christina, after school? Well, I, I lived in Estonia, uh, so uh, I, I lived through the transition together with the rest of the country. So obviously we stayed where we were. Uh, Soviet Union collapsed, we gained independence and we started building their country from scratch. So obviously things changed. The schooling system started changing, uh, but it's still in the process because these are not things to, to change easy. So uh, it was about five years after Soviet Union collapsed that I graduated. So I pretty much went through the whole uh, 
through the whole education system in the Soviet system. But then, of course, later, uh, later I was exposed to the West. So I got my master's degree actually in uh, in Edinburgh. <laughs> it was a great, a great experience. So I did I did have a smooth sailing into the Western world. Everything is fine. But uh, you know, it's interesting because. Um, we were talking about sacrifices later on uh, in business. Um, I remember I had a very tough partnership with uh, with, with a, a woman, and uh, out of six years of our partnership, three were very torturous. And I wanted to come back to that idea of sacrifices in the contemporary, like in our let's say twenty first century, fairly affluent countries who have access to to, to internet and the, and the freedom of speech. Yeah. You know, it's interesting how we we still sometimes say that I'm doing this for someone else. Like I wouldn't divorce for the children. I would wouldn't get uh, leave this relationship for you know not to hurt someone or I wouldn't leave job because I have responsibilities and we feel that we uh, we have to do these things for someone else for something bigger so I actually um, had this breaking point when I realized that sacrifice uh, the mundane everyday sacrifice is not exactly what it was when we lived in Soviet Union it's yeah. something completely different so I was in this partnership for six years and three of them were torture and I was telling my myself a story that I'm doing that for the business, for the people who work for us, for our partners, for our clients. And I have to do that. You know, it's the business. It's, it's the life of an entrepreneur. I have to, yeah. uh, you know, suck it up, <laughs> swallow my feelings and yeah. go do the right thing. Uh, especially if you consider that I was brought up on this whole idea that you sacrifice yourself for the greater good. It was uh, much later when I finally got the courage to, to separate with this business partner and then we broke up and the business I had to reinvent my business and some people stayed with us. You know, I realized so one of the ladies who, who had worked with me through all these years, she came to me later and she said, you know, you guys were pretending that everything is okay. You were uh, so obviously unhappy and keep going doing the business. But we, the rest of us in the team, we were suffering because you didn't like each other. It was a really bad, uh, bad place. So we all suffered. And she, you know, when she told me that, it really hit home because I realized that uh, not only not only was the sacrifice uh, pretty much a story I told myself, it was, you know, I was afraid. And that beautiful story that I'm doing it for someone else was just a story because it was easier to say that I'm sacrificing my happiness for someone else than to tell myself that I'm just afraid to stay alone in business. Yeah. You were so it was a story, but not only that, it was useless. Yeah. I didn't make anyone yeah. happy with that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like that was uh, you were afraid to be yourself, which was the act of just be like your authentic self. Um, and by staying in that loop, by staying in that story, and, and feeling that you have to uh, keep suffering because it's what you need to do. Um, that was preventing you from being possibly who you are now, feeling more aligned. Would that be correct? Yeah. Well. Um... You know, uh, to be yourself, you have to know yourself, and that's uh, that's a whole different uh, discussion. You, we often. Uh, I'll, I'll probably give an analogy. It's it, it just just to to explain my thought. And as a perfectionist, <laughs> obviously, I have a picture of what it is to be a perfect version of me, and everybody has that. And people who are interested in any kind of growth or development or learning they usually uh, are striving towards a better version of themselves. Mm. Uh, in psychology, there is this interesting phenomenon. I don't know the word for that, but when you fall in love with someone, you're actually not falling in love with an actual person, but you're falling in love with an image of that person for several reasons, partially because you want to fall in love. It's, it, there is this need to actually like someone, to love someone. So you uh, close your eyes on things which might th seem a little bit odd. So you, you don't see the red flags, you idealize the person, and partially because the person is also trying so hard that you like them, they put on their best behavior. So what happens is that very often when we're infatuated, we don't love the actual person, we love our idea of that person. Mm. And then as time goes and the relationship forms, hopefully, and you get to know the person, you start finding out things which don't correspond to that picture that you had uh, in your head. Yeah. And um, there are different scenarios which can unfold, but very often we get disillusioned and disappointed yeah, and we hurt. Fall, we fall in love with specific traits. Yes. 
And uh, yeah. to a certain degree, it happens pretty much uh, in, in any process of infatuation. So it, we do that with an image of ourselves as well. We have this beautiful image of what it means to be a perfect Christina. I can imagine it's attainable. But that image is just like that, you know, story of infatuation. It's me uh, being on my best behavior and me also closing eyes to, uh, on certain red flags and believing. So that's that's the interesting thing. I don't think people actually know themselves as yeah. much as they think they do. And is that, I think, from what I'm uh, hearing from you, Christina, is like most people set up a fantasy of how they think things are supposed to be, how they think they're supposed to be. They set up a fantasy also of this perfect partner. And when they see the other side, when everybody has both sides, they've, they've got the good and the bad, the positive and the negative, the support and the challenge. But we all want the one side. We all want the support without the challenge, the positive without the negative. And when so, that doesn't match up. You know, it's... I think it would be half the problem if it was about the world. Like, yeah, world doesn't correspond to our ideal. <laughs> and we kind of know that. <laughs> and it's okay. The problem is that our perfect version of ourselves is not often exactly the reality. So, and human mind doesn't like being hurt. So what we do, we actually, uh, there, there are such things as coping mechanisms. If, if you face something which you don't enjoy, you come up with a, a reaction which helps you feel feel better about it a very uh, maybe dramatic but but uh, illustrative example is when something really bad happens for example you lose someone you love the first reaction very often to a lot of people is denial you don't accept the fact that this has happened mm. and that's uh, as i said it's a very dramatic there are a lot of different mechanisms and uh, that's what happens to us as well to some degree you might not uh, like you might not be what you would like yourself to be. And probably you are not exactly what you would like yourself to be. So what do you do? You can be honest with yourself and it's a painful process. And then you'll learn yourself. But mostly, usually we either are in denial or we, you know, reframe the whole situation. We explain it in a different way. We sugarcoat it. There are so many different ways to deal with something which we don't like. That's why I say I do not know how much we really know ourselves. Yeah, And I've been digging and, and sometimes it's not good to know to, to, to stay in your head so much, but I've, I've been on this process to, of getting to know myself for, for the past few years and I still am very often surprised at what I discover and, not, and sometimes not very satisfied with what I discover. So yeah. it's, it's a process and yeah, uh, it, it's a necessary process. For sure. It's a, I suppose for me, like it's a process of acceptance, which is looking at all sides, looking at all traits and looking at both like good traits, bad traits. I always like to use that quote, which is most people want to be loved for who they are, but most people are afraid to be who they are. Um, and that's like, like, again, going back to being the authentic self, but who has that authentic self? And I think that if we create a fantasy of trying to be this one-sided person, which a lot of people do, we create conflict for ourselves. And then when we're not matching this fantasy that we set for ourselves, we beat ourselves up. Uh, you know, it's, um, sorry, I, I, I keep, because I, I get hooked on some of the things that you say, and sometimes I don't answer your questions. So if I if I go away, no, just, yeah. just bring me back and tell me you didn't answer. I have this tendency, I'm really sorry. So, you know, um, so about authentic selves, that's that's another interesting thing because I believe authenticity is relationship with yourself and it has nothing to do with the rest of the world. Unfortunately, psychologists have not come up with a definition for what it means to be authentic selves. So I guess the best we can go for by is uh, anthropology <laughs> because they're the ones who talk about authenticity. In, in uh, psychology, we talk about slightly different processes, but I believe that authenticity is essentially your relationship with yourself. What you, the world thinks of you is uh, a secondary thing. But in contemporary world, we have this interesting phenomenon. I do not know why, but when, while we were talking, it just hit me somehow. We have this interesting phenomenon where we almost want to tell people what it means to be authentic, yeah. which is such an interesting thing, isn't it? It's like uh, we, we tell people what it means to be happy. We tell people what it means to be uh, positive, what it means to be uh, productive, and what it means to be you, which is so interesting because um, I'm leaning towards the, the, the idea that, you know, if you're a reclusive person and you are an introvert and you are quiet and you don't like to be in the, uh, around the people, then maybe not being vulnerable in public is authentically you. Yeah. But the society nowadays is so 
sometimes so strict on what it means to be authentic. Uh, I don't know why this thought just crossed my mind, but I really felt like sharing it. Yeah, fantastic. And thank you for sharing it. But I, I get you in terms of what you're saying. Like we do, we get, we, we buy into the conditioning a lot of the times and the conditioning is so strong. And if we step outside of that conditioning, like fear kicks in and we're afraid to be who we are because we want to be accepted. It's part of the tribe. It's part of our DNA. But for me, I feel that we all have like a, a unique um, set of values. Every single person has a unique fingerprint. Um, and if we can live up to those values that are in line with us, then I feel that we're getting into that authentic mm. self uh, instead of living a life of injected values by society or other people. Yeah, but to, to know your values, you have to actually be able to hear uh, what, well, I'll, I'll use a very unscientific phrase, but what your heart says. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's an interesting thing. Um, you know, you said, uh, you also said that we want people to love us as we are and to accept us the, for the way they are. But the thing is that, the first question you have to ask, do I love myself the way I am? Because I believe that we train the world to treat us the way we treat ourselves. So if I think I'm uh, not valuable, then I'll, I'll see the, the proof of that and people will actually take me as, as such. And if I think that I'm lovable, uh, even though I'm imperfect, mm. then, then that's the first necessary step for finding someone who will love you for what you are for your imperfection i don't think like we often we we hope that if somebody will love me the way i am then maybe i'll, I'll convince myself that i'm lovable but it doesn't work in that direction the causality goes the other way you first you first have to accept yourself then the world will accept you the way you are uh and uh, God, somehow you, you touch upon such deep things that I, my, my thought just runs around and I, I want to talk about everything. Uh, Go with the flow, as I said, <laughs> the flow. Um, and it's true in what you said. And, and what I'm hearing is like, the more you value yourself, the more the world will value you and the more other people will value you as well too. And it's such a hard concept. Um, and it's such a hard thing, I suppose, for us to like learn um, and integrate with ourselves because we don't really get shown. Like we don't get taught this type of information. It's it's like certain types of conditioning the whole way through from um, when we're born the whole way through to adulthood. We don't learn that emotional intelligence. We don't get taught it. I know that I haven't anyway. So um, <laughs> well, things we... that I wanted to integrate in myself and educate myself on so that I can educate other people on as well too. Yeah, and we don't get a lot of uh, good examples, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think it's so hard, though, because um, it's perfectionism. It's per perfectionism, and we treat love towards ourselves as some kind of a trade-off. If mm -hmm. I am my best self, then I'm worth loving. And if I'm not, then I, 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 bad you. But who did that? Our parents do that. Oh, you didn't clean your room. Mommy is upset. Oh, you've, you did something well. You ate your veggies well. Oh, I love you so much. We learn from childhood to buy love with good deeds. Mm. And then we treat ourselves the same way. And I'm not saying that all parents do that to us, but it is, it is uh, in our nature. This kind of manipulation is in our nature. And unless we are completely conscious, we tend, it's an easy way. We tend to do that too. I, I catch myself sometimes saying like, am I trading love for my kids right now? So every time I'm upset with them, I have to finish it with a long tirade that, yeah, you know, actually I love you no matter what you do. And I'll always accept you <laughs> because I'm, it's, it's just the way it is. So we treat ourselves the same way. There is this perfect picture what it means to be perfect me and if i don't correspond to that picture then i'm going to withhold love until i behave well and i am that perfect me and then i'm willing to give myself love mm. and then we are surprised oh world doesn't take me the way i am well you don't take it the way you are yeah true um and that's so true um yeah and you're right it's not necessarily that it's hard to do but if you're not conscious of it if you're not aware of it and if you're not trying um to balance out of yourselves i suppose those tools don't just come naturally you have to go looking for them and you have to be willing sometimes to kind of go that wee bit deeper and go through some of the ugly work in order for it to happen yeah you know it's interesting i've been in personal growth for 18 years and we all have this concept that it's all uh, that is going to be painful and hard there will be pain in life Absolutely. There's no question about that. Mm. Uh, but I would like people to think about pain a little bit differently, not as something to, to be afraid of or to, to be displeased with. Like if you go to the gym and you exercise, uh, regular gym, weight training, 
and you get out of the gym and if your muscles don't hurt, you tell yourself, oh, I didn't exercise well. So that kind of physical pain and physically speaking, medically speaking, it's absolutely objectively pain when your muscles are hurting and you can't walk up the stairs. It, it is pain, but we welcome it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bother us. Yeah. We actually, it, you can actually even enjoy it in some funny masochistic way. So I, I, I would like to invite people to, to take life a little easier and not to think that everything is a huge struggle and, yeah. and pain and complication. No, yes, of course, there will be unpleasantness. There will be sadness. There will be fear. There will be things we don't like. But maybe, maybe if you look at it like the muscle pain after the gym, you know, it, it, it changes you, it grows you. It, it, well, there, there is potential for growth, for transformation, for learning and all of that. Then maybe, or maybe not even that, you know, sometimes, sometimes pain reminds you of your values, of things that you love. You know, the pain of, of uh, separating with someone that you love, it is painful. You miss the person, but you, it also reminds you that you have had love in your life. Mm -hmm. Can you celebrate that part of it? I think I think uh, life is just so juicy and we sometimes try to numb it. Yeah, so we have to find the benefit. Like, obviously, we go to the gym, we see the benefit, we know the perceived benefit when we go through this type of pain, we grow, we get uh, the adaptation from it. Sometimes some of those other things, especially emotionally, like if we can find the benefit of going through that perceived pain there and then, um, we'll be a wee bit more willing to actually do the work and, and go through there. So as an entrepreneur as well too, Christina, obviously you've been a, a co-founder and one of the biggest self-development platforms on the planet, uh, Mind Valley. What was that journey like for you? What were those early days in, in Mind Valley being formed? Um, what did you learn from it yourself in business as an entrepreneur? So, you know, it's funny because I guess this is another learning from Soviet Union because we lived with an idea of co uh, communism. <laughs> so when, when we started building Mind Valley, don't take it too seriously, <laughs> take it with a pinch of salt. But when we started uh, creating Mind Valley, of course, we, it started um, as any other business <laughs> on the couch. <laughs> and the first uh, sites were programmed in pajamas and, and things like that. You know, like everybody has done that. But somehow, maybe because I'm from the Soviet Union, for me, it has always been this beautiful unicorn, you know, this beautiful company. So I've always lived somewhere in the future uh, before we even uh, made it there. Uh, it was, uh, it, it, and it is still uh, a creation of vision. My ex-husband and, and now we're just co-parents, friends and business partners. Yeah. So it is his child, for sure. It's his passion. It's his ideas. He he started it. I was uh, in, in the beginning, I was more of, an, of a witness to it. I was a co-founder and I did some practical things mm -hmm. <laughs> in the business, but uh, I've always taken the role of just being there and, and witnessing this thing uh, growing. Maybe maybe another funny analogy, but like with children, you have the mom who has the sleepless nights and nurses the baby and all of that. And then you have the dad who just looks looks on the side and says, I have your back. So I was the dad <laughs> with our children. I was the mom with, with this baby of ours. I was the dad. And it, it was always a great journey and I've always believed in it, but it has moved uh, through a lot of iterations and, and mutations. Uh, and when we started, it was just a little site uh, to, to um, get people for visions, uh, meditation classes. And then uh, we learned certain tricks and other authors wanted us to help. So we started growing from there and then it became a publishing. So we actually, in, in between, we were more like marketers for some authors, but we don't like remembering that stage too much because marketing is a very uh it, it's it's a technical thing it's it's a yeah. skill in a way right not so much a passion or a mission mm -hmm. and then uh, then we became publishers and then we started seeing ourselves as a, as an educational institution platform so it was an evolution it wasn't that one day vision said oh let's bring uh, let's build the biggest platform of course you want success you want mm -hmm. big revenues you want to be a unicorn or whatnot but um, but your mission and, and your your child, your baby, it evolves as it, as it grows. And I think similarly, like with children, you give your children the best, but you can't really force them or insist that they do things the way you imagine is right for them. They do have their own will, their own personalities, their own inclinations. And when they grow up, that's when you see what you have created. Mm. You can't see when it's a baby. So the same with the business. We very often are so forceful. Yeah, I want it this way. So I guess the blessing uh, for us was that vision was always uh, 
was always open to seeing his business as more than just his creation, as a mission. And when it becomes a mission, when it becomes bigger than you, then you allow uh, the rest, the, the, the circumstances, the people who are involved, the universe even, to, to contribute to the evolution of that business. So it is vicious creation. I was the daddy on the sidelines in a way, but it is also a creation of the time of the people of our community of what is needed. So it is an interesting creature, which is still evolving. So we'll see yeah. where it goes yeah. further. And obviously it's a massive global uh, company now that's having a massive global reach and inspiring a lot of people and doing a lot of great work um, in terms of the message. And it's funny because when you see something that is so big um, in terms of where it is right now, a lot of the times we think that that is the goal at the start um, and people must have had it all together and they must have had everything and all the ducks in a row and they're able to just implement it. But I think it's like everybody, isn't it? And every single business, it's it's the struggles, it's the pains, it's the ups and the downs, it's the challenges and the never ending pursuit, I suppose, when you have something that's really aligned with you in, in terms of the message you want to deliver, to keep pushing forward. Um, mm. Do you feel that that was... As an entrepreneur, is that something that you have to um, know innately and have, or can you work on that and condition that for yourself? Well, uh, I guess we all keep learning as uh, as we live our lives. So even as parents, if you if you talk to people who have teenagers, they're probably much wiser than those who have just delivered their baby. In business, it's the same. You can have a business plan and plan it all ahead, but that's it's not going to work too long, unfortunately, because life is going to bring uh, its changes. And, and the most uh, remarkable example was in the beginning 2020, 20, when all our plans were <laughs> sent to pieces because, because uh, you know, the universe threw a, a surprise yeah. at us. So it's the, the, the life is uncertain. This is the only th certain thing in life is that it is uncertain. And of course, you have to plan ahead, but you also have to have enough flexibility and openness to change and adjust because it's not going to be as you imagine. It's like when you go out on a quest, you step out of the house and you think, OK, I have to go through the forest, through the mountains and go into the cave. I'm uh, pretty much describing Hobbit's journey right now. But <laughs> that's, it's not going to be a linear journey. You will discover that there are like orcs attacking you and then you'll change your course. That's how business works as well. It's a journey. And when you step out of the house, you might know that, yes, I'm pr approximately trying to be there. Hmm. But you have to be ready that you will have to adjust your course, because if you're not, you're going to die very yeah. early because, uh, well, evolutionarily, those speeches who are here now are those who were adaptable. Hmm. That's why cockroaches will stay forever, because they are the most adaptable creatures. Yeah. You have to be adaptable. It's part of uh, part of the deal for business. And another interesting thing, you just mentioned that as well. You know, I think. Your business becomes, when your business becomes really big, it's because you release it and you allow it to be bigger than you, bigger than your own ego, bigger than your own ambition to prove anyone or anything. And I believe that the biggest business people that we really admire, they actually have had this moment where they have released their business and you might be under impression that it is yours and you're the one who will tell that's how it's going to be. But it's like with children as well. You, only when you release your child will the child actually open its full potential. If mm -hmm. you force your kids to do things that you the way you like, you are probably going to stunt their growth and, uh, and development. Yeah. So the same with business, only when you release and you allow it to be bigger than you, that's when it really breaks through all the glass ceilings and you, you can see the potential that it really has inside. But as long as you're like this possessive, obsessive, being a perfectionist, I know what it is. It's like, I, I have to decide, the reins are in my hands. You, you're just not going to allow it to be what it can be. Fantastic. And I think that comes from a almost like a, a position of fear and lack and, and scarcity in a way. Um, and, and again, most business owners and entrepreneurs, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be just like easy to be able to just let go of things like that because they feel like they need to be in control in order for it to get to where it is that it needs to be. Um, and there's a fantastic book. I'm not sure if you've listened to it before called the surrender experiment. Um, I, I have to buy it. I've heard about it so many times over the past three years. I know I have to buy it. <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic lesson. And, and that's his whole emphasis, which is letting go and letting go to what the universe actually um, presents to you in, in every stage of life. And it's that is a, a thing for me as a, as a coach, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. It's something that I'm trying to get through myself also, which is 
learning to let go of the rain sometimes, learning to let go of the business to get it to where I want it to be. Um, it's definitely not an easy thing to do. But if you could apply certain things or certain tools, like what would you recommend or what would you um, tell other entrepreneurs and business owners to do to let that process happen? You know, I, I believe they should read the book probably. It's, uh, it explains this better because for me, letting go is this mysterious thing. Definitely letting go is absolutely necessary for pretty much anything in this life. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to let go. You can't control things uh, all the time. It's just not productive enough. But it's it's a funny thing. It's I find it ironic because uh, uh, physically speaking, letting go is easy. You let go of resistance, right? You go with the flow, you trust. Physically speaking, it is easy. It's when you relax. Mm. But it's our mind. You know, it's like this dialogue. How do you let go? You let go. But can you explain it? You can't explain it. You let go, right? Or how do, how do you explain certain things which are inexplicable? So I have this analogy, which maybe can help a little bit. Uh, so when, I, uh, when I'm very afraid, I, I remember um, jumping with a parachute. Uh, so I was talking about my business partner uh, that, that I had really hard relationships with, and, and we separated three years too late. Uh, and I remember that journey of, of getting to that separation. The interesting thing is that it took me three years to summon the courage to, to say, um, I think this relationship has to end. It's not working. Uh, so, and I remember writing that email to her. It took me, my, my business partner was a woman. Uh, it took me half an hour. Well, it, it took me five minutes to write an email. And then I was half an hour sitting above the email and not daring to press the button send. And I thought I will only send it if I really mean it. And if it's not an ultimatum or some kind of manipulative tactics to you know, change her behavior. So for half an hour, I was sitting there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> rereading the email. And then finally I said, okay, I'll send it. So three years of, of fear, half an hour of not being able to even send the email. And then I'll go to sleep. And in the morning when I wake up, I remember that morning standing in front of the mirror in my bathroom. And I felt, I almost could see in my eyes, wings behind my back. I felt so light. This one moment from fear to actually feeling that I didn't care if I go bankrupt. I didn't care. I didn't mind anything. I was like, I am free to be me and to express myself. And I don't have to suffer. So even if everything goes to pieces, I don't mind because I'm enjoying just being me and just expressing myself. Mm -hmm. So I remembered um, you know, later, it connected um, in my mind with my parachute experience, skydiving experience. Uh, when I, I went for the first one, we set the timing and I remember how it was two weeks down the road or something. I didn't dare to plan anything. It was so scary. I knew that statistically speaking, it was safer than driving to the drop zone. But I still couldn't imagine it. So I didn't plan anything as if I was about to die on that day. So as we were driving to this drop zone, I was still thinking, uh, I don't have to jump out of the plane. And then I dress up the gear. I think I don't have to jump out of the plane. Then, uh, you know, I go into the plane. And I think maybe I can still land. And then you stand there in front of this door and you're like, What's happening? I don't have to make this. Letting go, physically speaking, is super easy. Jump out of the plane. It's just one step. If you step off the carpet onto the floor, it doesn't take any physical effort. It takes minimal physical effort. Fortunately, the guy behind me just kicked me out. So I, I fell out of the plane. And the funny thing is that I'm flying and I'm like, oh my God, I'm flying. And I didn't even want to open my chute. So the guy who was jumping me had to open it because I was like, I'm not done. I enjoy flying. And it was exactly the same way in my life. Hmm. This paralyzing fear was so terrible that I couldn't imagine anything on the other side of this, uh, like, you know, um, this, this um, door, which in real life is not really a door. But the difference between this paralyzing fear and the feeling of flying is just this one step of letting go. And physically speaking, it's not hard. It's our mind that holds on. So coming back to letting go, you know, I think that very often we want to leave the root of escape or some kind of plan B. And if we come back to the analogy with the parachute, it's like comparing skydiving with bungee jumping. Mm. You know, bungee, cord, it's like this connection. I can fly back yeah. to the, you know, you can pull me back to the plane. So which one do you want? Do you want to fly or do you want to dangle? We often think that we are 
I, I'm going to try. I'm going to go and try it. No, you have to cut this cord if you want to fly. Love that. Otherwise, we will keep dangling. Yeah, I, I love that analogy. Do you want to fly or do you want to dangle? Fantastic. Uh, and I think most of us are <laughs> at a lot of the times dangling. We're, we're afraid. We, we want to control the outcome a lot of the times. Yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, you wrote a book, um, Live By Your Own Rules. You've another one that's coming up and we'll talk about that. But to give people, um, the listeners, a bit of context, what is Live By Your Own Rules? What was the inspiration for it? Uh, and what's the book about? <laughs> well, I do not know if I should give you honest answer or a beautiful answer. <laughs> so, <the> honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that I'm in personal growth and I'm an entrepreneur. And a few years ago, one of my mentors said, you have to, you have to, you know, write a book, create a course, go speak on stage. And being perfectionist, I did as I was told. So I created this course, Live By Own Rules. It was called Live By Own Rules, but essentially the initial version of it was um, in a way regurgitation of everything that I learned in personal growth and transformation, because I've been around the best teachers, the best books, authors, teachings for so many years. So that was like years ago. So I was maybe 12, 13 years into, into the business. Mm. So and obviously it was easy to create something which I thought was like a manual for good life. So I'd, I had pieces of different things which uh, influenced me the most. That was the initial version of it. And then uh, I hit 40 and midlife crisis happened. <laughs> and then a lot of things changed in my life. <laughs> I literally grabbed a sledgehammer and decided to break my perfect, beautiful, Instagrammable life into pieces because I thought it wasn't, you know, it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Mm. So uh, the new version of Live By Own Rules was a very different beast. I kept the name, I think the name is perfect, but the new version is actually about finding the path back to you. And um, the book that I'm writing, so that that is the course, Live By Own Rules is the course, but the book that I'm writing is loosely connected to the course. Uh, I gave it, a, it's, a, it's a working title, it's uh, The Art of, Become, of Being Flossom. Mm. So it is actually about, uh, about thriving in your imperfection. Uh, so that's that's what the the course and the book is about. Um, and you know, um, it's it's interesting why, why. So I want to come back to the midlife crisis. The thing is that you know I was a perfectionist and I studied well and I am the only child of my parents. So obviously I couldn't afford making mistakes. I had to do everything perfect because there was no one to 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 do better than I did my my whole family depended on my on me being perfect uh, and I th I thought until 40 that I was doing the things that I like to do that I wanted to do I actually uh, gave up thriving career here in Estonia followed my heart got married to a person from a completely different culture followed him to US then to Malaysia of all places I lived in Asia for 16 years I felt like I was doing the things listening to my heart but somewhere along the line I got lost and that's an interesting thing because we have this concept that the evil society is telling us what to do <laughs> evil society is the one that places us in the rut in the rat race it's the parents who don't understand us who tell us go study this but in reality I think it is not quite so it is our personal decision very often even if we think that our parents expect us to do certain things like if somebody told you to jump out of the house, you wouldn't do that because you know it would kill you. So very often the decisions that we say we don't have a choice, actually, there is somewhere deep inside us this thing, this, this voice that tells you to do the right thing. So just more, to be more practical, hmm. you know, we are taught that success is a necessary condition for happiness. So very often, and we are taught that success and logic are the things which are sure. So when you sometime in your life have a dilemma between following your heart, following your natural inclination versus doing the right thing, the so-called right thing, and doing, going the route of success, it's not that your parents tell you, oh, don't go study astrophysics, go study, uh, you know, business, it's, uh, it will bring you more money. No, you personally also think that following the heart is risky business. It is much more certain to follow the the definition of success by society because this is measurable you know yeah. you can plan it you can work for it you can work harder yeah you can measure it yes so it's very often we we think that 
some kind of evil society, like a beast is telling us do that. But no, inside we are also much more inclined to follow the path which we think is more certain, which is actually following a very decided path of success. And yes, every society has a definition of what the path to success means. So it was somewhere at the age of 40 where I actually did have a perfect life. I was married, I have two children, I had a business that I loved, I loved my work, I was actually marketing at that time, I was traveling the world, my life was perfect by the, the definition of society. Mm -hmm. it, I was pursuing success. But somewhere deep inside, I had compromised my personal happiness for success because I thought that my personal happiness is, is not a certain thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I broke my life into pieces and I started reinventing it. And it is scary, but it feels so much better. What do you feel, um, Christina, is that from like that intuition, that inner guidance, like, is that a, a deeper thing from a, um, a spiritual point of view? Is it your soul? Like we all seem to have it. You said, listen to the heart and you go back thousands of years, the heart was known and, and related to the subconscious mind. And what do you feel that is for you? Is that just, uh, intuition um, that we all have or do you feel that it is more of a, a deeper meaning um, <laughs> a bigger meaning um, what's your own personal take on it uh, I definitely believe in uh, in uh, in higher power God universe I believe in all of that but another legacy from Soviet Union I'm a very pragmatic person so uh, I could have a theory but uh, I would I would actually not like to to share things unless um, unless I can tell that it, that it is so. So I believe uh, I, I would rather want to give you a more more a clinical answer to that. I think That's the problem <laughs> and the more clinical answer would be authenticity, the lack of authenticity. Mm -hmm. You don't really know what you are, and why do you not know what you are? Because we are emotionally illiterate. Yes, there is definitely soul, there is definitely high calling and all of that, but it's, it's like uh, in Maslow's pyramid, we, we can deal with that too, but let's take care of the things which are simple, mm -hmm. which is super simple and accessible to everyone. I do believe everyone has intuition. I do believe everyone has a higher purpose, but we can get to that mm -hmm. if you just allow yourself, if you clear out the, the, the layer number one, which is what is the authentic you. So, I, I believe we are uh, we are emotionally illiterate people because we do not know how to deal with emotions. We are not told how to feel. We are told how not to feel. Don't cry. It's not important. Why are you so upset about that? Why are you so dramatic? Oh, you shouldn't be angry. That's what we hear. We are heard what not to feel. And we feel shame for what we feel. But the thing is that, and I, I won't go deep into that theory because I could talk and rant about that for all time. Emotions are to us, more like signals. Like in physical body, we have pain for a reason. There is such a thing that which is called something analgesia where a person doesn't feel physical pain. And these people don't live long because their bodies deteriorate and break without them noticing because they don't feel physical pain. So <laughs> like you, you could theoretically lose a limb on a walk and not notice because you don't feel pain. And that's why their bodies deteriorate because they break and you don't pay attention. That's why we give, um, uh, we, emotions have the same role in our life. They're given to us so that we pay attention to certain areas in life. And if we have emotional analgesia, we are going to deteriorate psychologically speaking. So what happens is that people don't really get to know themselves because we don't experience life fully. We don't allow ourselves to experience life fully. We shun certain things, certain emotions. We think that something is good and something is bad. You know, love is good, hatred is bad. Jealousy is bad. Kindness is good. I actually love kindness. It's one of my favorite qualities. But the thing is that hatred, jealousy, anger, fear, they're all there for a reason. They're not bad. They're just not pleasant. Mm and unfamiliar to us. There are more than 200, maybe 300 words, adjectives for different emotions in English language. How many do you know off the top of your head? Mm. Do we even know that there are degrees of, you know, intensity of emotion? The different shades of emotion mean different things about you. We don't know how to deal with that life. Mm. 
That's why I say we are emotionally literate and I, you don't even have to believe in spirituality and God and anything to even deal with this simple layer because this is pure, simple science. There are no two ways about that. When we talk about say spirituality or or higher purpose then we get into values area which is a little bit different because i believe that there are so many different values so some people might uh, value uh, you know <laughs> altruism other people might value happiness or whatnot we might have different values and it's okay that's why i don't want to talk about spiritual spirituality until we clear out the simple things yeah. the things that we can all agree about you have to get to know yourself and you can only get to know yourself if you are okay seeing yourself as you are yeah for me that's accepting both sides that's accepting and, and not building that fantasy of who you think you should be um and accepting both sides of who you are the good the bad the ugly the nice every single part for sure um fantastic christina for you touched on a few things there as well too and like one of them being the emotions and how much we don't actually sit with them and a lot of the times we try and suppress them and we, we're kind of taught that way but even going back to all of that those feelings and those emotions and and again a lot of them are just words as you said and labels that we attach um to um, and we don't understand how to actually process them properly for you uh, in terms of your purpose and your mission is, is this with the path that you're on is that the inspiration that you have to teach people and educate people like they know themselves better to be <laughs> oh. emotionally intelligent or or what do you feel what's the inspiration for yourself right now christina moving forward and growing it's it's an interesting <laughs> and dangerous question well i i ask myself sometimes yes why do i do what i do uh for me it's self-expression purely just self-expression because i have one interesting belief uh, and i cannot go against that uh, I think that you can't fix people and you shouldn't. And I think that every person has a right to their journey. And uh, as they say, every student is ready, you know, every student finds a teacher when they're ready for that. So yes, uh, writing a book is the act of manipulation because in a way I'm trying to instill certain ideas into people. But uh, I remind myself that this, for me, this is foremost um, self-expression. As much as I would like people to, to be happy or to, to uh, you know, as, as much as I might sometimes feel that, uh, oh, your problem is so easy to solve, here's the solution. I have to be honest with myself. I cannot change other people and I shouldn't. Mm. I, I can offer help if I'm asked for it. I can share my opinions if people are interested to hear. I can share my opinion if people that are not interested to hear, but be okay with the fact that they might not believe me or might not take it. And that's not just about every uh, about audience, you know, people who will buy my book eventually. It's also about the people that I love. And that's the hardest. I have children and of course I want them to do things which I think will make them happy, but I also have to remind myself that this is their journey, their life's journey, and they're getting uh, the, the experiences the way they need them. Mm. And the best thing I can do is not to fix them, but to be there for them, keep my light on for them, no matter what happens. Because if they come and ask for help, or I could offer them help, but it is not in my hands to give them an experience in life. All I can do is be there for them yeah. when they are ready for that. Okay. And that's that's why I don't think my mission is to, well, I, it will sound probably terrible, but my mission is not to help anyone. I do hope that my experience and that my constantly being in my head <laughs> and my pain that I have gone through will maybe give an answer to someone who is ready to hear it. Mm. It's, but it's, I'm not out there to help anyone. What you touched on there was... Um children i can't remember where i heard it or who i heard it from but they said that your children aren't of you they come through you yeah. and letting them like be themselves and not just children we you know it's now in nature to try to save the day and fix the people and help the people especially the ones that we love hmm. yeah but you can't you know if the same as we get pain for a reason like if you have let's say uh, something in your body which is off that requires your attention medical attention you will feel the pain you can take a painkiller but you haven't solved the problem right you need to go to the doctor you need to diagnose it properly you need to treat it properly mm -hmm. the same thing happens to us and our loved ones we see them struggling or suffering or whatever and we want to go and fix it for them but they got this experience for a reason because they need this experience 
So what happens? Your help is very often, or your meddling with their life, is very often like a painkiller. The experience will come back if they haven't learned the lessons that they needed to learn. But you might not be around. And that's, that's super hard, I know, because when we were separating the vision, I've caused pain to a lot of people that I love. And standing by and trying to find fortitude to see people telling you that, oh, you're hurting me. <laughs> what you're doing is hurting me. And still staying true to your values and understanding that you know their, their reaction to your decision is their journey. And my journey is to stand there and try to be strong when I see someone who, who wants who wants you to just please them yeah and i and by the way i want to say i don't believe in tough love i think it's a, it's it's a it's a nasty thing i still think that you can you can stay true to your values with kindness and compassion yeah. to the rest of the world but, but even what you touched on there in terms of the pain and, and like hurting other people and and one of my mentors dr d martini uh, has philosophy and, and like there's never one side without the other so and that perceived pain that you go through at that certain time um, and you thought that that was trauma or one of the worst experiences you had, you look back in hindsight and think that was a blessing. I would <laughs> never change that. That was one of the best experiences and got me on the path to be who I am right now and, and where I'm actually supposed to be. And I think he talked about, which is wisdom is an instantaneous recognition. The crisis is a blessing. And it's been able to see both sides at that time, which is hard a lot of the times when you're in it. But when we look back, a lot of times we see it. You know, I, I I don't want to be very contradictory, but it's um it's in a good case. It's a good case scenario. Uh, I think that uh, what doesn't kill you makes you maybe harder, tougher, but not, doesn't necessarily make you better. Hmm. Fortunately, you uh, we interact with people who have the framework for uh, and the necessary skills and often necessary support for them to, to grow through pain and to become better. And I agree when I, it's like Viktor Frankl, he said, uh, pain stops, ceases to be suffering when it, once it gets the meaning. So it, it really resonates with me that, that idea that if you find the meaning for your pain, it will stop being suffering. But the problem is, unfortunately, because we are not just emotionally illiterate, but in many other ways illiterate, majority of the people don't have the necessary context to grow from pain, unfortunately. That's why we have so, many, so much trauma. That's why we have so much violence. We have, uh, we have conflicts. We have problems in life because we, uh, we are not given the necessary, the necessary framework to deal with, with uh, unpleasant things, with pain. And yeah. we've tried to figure it out on our own. So it's like with, with body, I like to compare everything with body. If you cut the body, it will probably scar. Mm. And the scar depends on how you treat the wound, right? So you can, you can become better for sure. But for me, a painful experience is a crossroad. And which way you will go depends so much on what you have in your life. Do you have the framework? Do you have the support? Do you have someone to, you know, to stand by there, to be there for you? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so I've just seen on your Instagram that you have the manuscript and the book um, basically all done and dusted. What, when is the date for the launch? When is it going to be published? Or, or can you um, fill us on? God, I wish I knew. So first of all, I was supposed to be done with the manuscript by September. I, I finished by the end of November. <laughs> it's not, not too bad uh, if you can never be finished with manuscript. And I have today, I just wrote to my publisher um, asking for what the, the next steps are. So in December, hopefully my editor will start going through. Through English is my third language. So there, there, there are obviously mistakes to be corrected. Uh, and I really, I really hope it will be published in, in January. I hope we can make it faster. But as far as I know, uh, the processes take time, you know, all this yeah all yeah. this stuff yeah so so next year it's going to be launched you'll have it out for next year for definite start of the year is up that is that what the aim is is it yes i was hoping by the end of this year but start of the next year is still good book is you know book it's not just work it's so funny because uh, being being entrepreneur and, and perfectionist you you set your deadlines and you work but this is a creation and it's much more emotional process so especially the first one so uh it, it just doesn't work the same way yeah, for sure. Christina, um, for people who are looking um, into knowing a wee bit more about you and what you do, etc., and uh, also looking to buy the book when it does launch or any other help that they're looking for, um, where's the best place that they can reach you, find you, get in touch with you? 
As a diligent entrepreneur, I will say Mind Valley. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we have loads of amazing authors there. I'm one of the authors, so you will find me there occasionally. Not very often. If you want me specifically, then it's my Instagram, of course. I do not know if I should uh, give you the handle here in, on air or if you can put yeah, it yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Okay, it's Christina Mand and it's uh, Christina with a K. It's Estonian way of writing and M A N D. So that's Instagram is where I write. I don't have writers there. I don't have anyone in between me and the audience. So that's, that's where you find most of me. Fantastic. Christina, thank you very much for taking the time out. Um, they jump on the podcast. They appreciate it. There's a, a there's a lot of gold nuggets in there, um, and the listeners will going to get a lot of value from that. So, Christina, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Thank you.